Hawaii. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm your inspirational buddy as we journey to take your health back. We are coming to you live from my home office in Makiki and downtown Honolulu from the studios of Think Tech Hawaii. Think Tech Hawaii features the hearts of about 30 very colorful and diverse show hosts. Today, we'll be talking story with a very accomplished and successful philanthropist that I feel so honored to call a friend. His name is Andrew M. Kluger, or may we call you Andy? I know sure. you Yay! <laughs> Born in Mexico City, but let's fast forward getting his Juris Doctorate from the University of San Francisco School of Law, his BA in International Affairs and Economics from UC Davis, and postgraduate studies from Cornell University. Wow. Till today, he utilizes all these degrees to accomplish so much for so many. Andy is the honorary counsel of the Republic of Mexico to the state of Hawaii. He's a board chair, <clears throat> excuse me, he's a board chair for the Mexican Museum San Francisco, which is an associate of the Smithsonian Institute. And Andy is the president what does he need a president of? He's the president of the Emergency Response International. Uh, it's an aeromedical company based in Guadalajara, Mexico. I met Andy when he was a trustee of St. Andrew's Priory here uh, in Hawaii, where my daughter Angela attended for 13 years. He is also the president of Book Bank USA, and the list goes on and on and on. And this is only a 30 minute show, so I had to just pull out a few of the highlights. So sorry, Andy, they, I mean, I think that's quite a bit already. So everyone, let's just welcome Andy. A como mai, Andy. Aloha. Aloha. So Andy, um, I felt very um, uh, compelled to having you on at this time of the year because September 15th through October 15th, is National Hispanic Heritage Month. So I thought it was very fitting to have Mr. Mexico himself with us to share his heart for this beautiful country of Mexico and to shed some insights on Mexico. So Andy, please share with us, what does this month of celebration look like? It's basically, Wendy, to remind people and sometimes to their children who have no connection with Mexico what Mexico and also the other Hispanic countries have shared and contributed to the culture and life in the United States as well as in Latin America. Wow, I know it's a big celebration because when I was in Mexico, whatever there's a celebration or a feast, they go all out, the people come to the streets and they celebrate wholeheartedly and that's what culture is all about. And I, I pray that it never stops because all these Cultural events, festivities are what make the country. And then the generations to follow, they can understand and receive it and, uh, and just um, cause, re, um, create memories. And that's what all this is all about. Is that correct, Andy? You're right, Wendy. No, it's, it's the same way with Hawaii, with Ohanas mm -hmm. and Aloha. It's the yeah. same thing with Mexico, with familias and, yes. you know, buenas cosas. So same thing. Wow. I've known you for many years, Andy, and I'm always impressed with all your introductions to your, of your friends to me. And I'm always like, wow, who else, don't, who don't you know, right? So here's a slide with a dear, dear friend of yours as she was visiting Hawaii as you judged the Miss Latina pageant directed by Nancy Ortiz. So please share with us a little bit about your dear friend, Guadalupe Rivera Marin. Guadalupe is the daughter of Diego Rivera. Yes. She was a very, she's a very accomplished person. She was a former senator and legislator in, in Mexico, a former ambassador to UNESCO from the United States, originally from Hawaii, um, in terms of, of where she started some of her diplomatic work. Uh, accomplished author. She's written a number of very important books, as well as a children's book called Mi Papa y Yo, My Father and I. Oh. And I've known her a long time in my life. In fact, she watched me or babysat me I was a little boy in Mexico also. So it's a, the history goes way back. She's one of the loveliest people I know. And Wendy, you were wonderful to host her in Hawaii also. And she really, she, she adored you. She does Thank adore you. you. And you know, I have that picture on my phone. And I'll tell you a little story. I was surfing about uh, eight, uh, four weeks ago and I heard an accent. So I asked a young lady, she's new to Hawaii. She's only like 22 years old. And I asked her, 
hey, and I showed her my phone. I says, do you know who this woman is? She goes, oh, yes, Diego Rivera, the, the daughter of Diego Rivera. I'm like, oh. and she was a young girl. And I was so impressed that she recognized this woman. And then she knew the family name. That's how historical this family has or how much history this woman has. And that's just the kind of friendships that you have built um, throughout your years and cherishing that, that they would come all the way here to be with you as you did an important event here in Hawaii. So even she um, loved, the, loved being in Hawaii. Yeah, she really did. I'm so glad. I, I, I just can't wait for her to return and just pray for her safe journey to and from Hawaii again. Well, let's so, keep hoping she stays healthy. Amen. Amen. And even when the tall ship of Mexico voyaged to Honolulu, you also voyaged to Honolulu to make sure that you were there to receive the people of Mexico as they came to Hawaii. So that was an incredible evening to be a guest on that tall ship with you and all the dignitaries of Mexico there along your side. Um, so tell us a little bit about the purpose of the voyaging tall ship that, that entered our Hawaii's harbors. Every year, Mexico, through its Naval Academy, sends one of the tall ships around the world to do ambassadorial calls. And one of the, the, the highlights for a lot of these young sailors who are training to be cadets and officers is stopping in Hawaii. So I arranged a couple of times with, with several presidents of Mexico to yeah. make sure that the tall ships stop. And they really loved it. And we arranged for wow. kids to perform for them there and yeah. your dance group also and your rowing team to be there also. So yes, it's very thank important you so for good much. Relations. Yep, yep, yep. It was an incredible evening for my, my Dragon Boat Race team to be uh, invited, guest of yours on that ship. And it was a night to remember. And it was a dream come true for many of them because we only see these beautiful ships in movies or you know in the news or in, in print. But to actually see it and then be invited on, Andy, you have no idea. I'm so proud. I'm so proud to just say that I was there and to meet all the magnificent um, people on that ship. I met the admirals of different countries when I go on the ship and then all the different um, dignitaries, as well as the crew. And then, as you mentioned, they perform their native dances of their villages for us in their native costumes, along with the best food ever, especially for, here, us, for us here in Hawaii to have such quality of great Mexican cuisine. Mahalo. Oh, my pleasure, really. I mean, the reality is that they only get to choose 30 ports worldwide. And Hawaii comes up in the first two or three that they Yay! want to see. Thank you. Well, it was people it like you, Wendy, Thank that you. make really a, a really good welcome for them. Thank Give them you. a lot of aloha. Truly yeah. appreciate it. And keep them coming. We, we love hosting them as well. Yeah. So, you know, as long as I've known you, Andy, you've always had a uh, history with emergency response. I know you were very much involved with and ran the Hawaii Air Ambulance. And currently you are the president of the Emergency Response International, an aeromedical company based in Guadalajara, Mexico. So tell us a little bit more about this professional part of you and about this venture and service. Well, I started running and owning Hawaii Air Ambulance in 1996 in Oahu. And we had 10, 10 airfields we worked out of in Hawaii. And we provided, and we still, the crew still provide assistance in Hawaii. Oh, mm -hmm. I sold Hawaii Air Ambulance, mm -hmm. you know, 15 years later, and it continued, and it's now part of AMR. Uh, right. But I love, the, I love the, the fact that first responders are very much involved in the importance of healthcare. I had the opportunity to come on board and take over Emergency Response International, which is an international aeromedical company. It's based in Guadalajara, Mexico, but it flies all over the world. And again, it does the same things that Hawaii Air Ambulance did. The problem that happens is um, that it's very difficult during this coronavirus incidences to be able to handle things. I, I sent you a photograph of some of the, the, the capsules where we have to put coronavirus patients. And right. we have to wear like spacesuits to, right. to protect cruise it's a very difficult time now it really is and coronavirus is very rampant right now in mexico as it's also trying to be controlled in the states and in the, our, our beautiful paradise island of hawaii yeah it's very hard but it's that so was something hard. we never experienced that was something we never experienced right before. And yeah what you created here and when um you know hawaii the islands being you know 30 40 minutes apart we direly needed that service and um um 
it has opened up a lot of eyes to a lot of my friends who worked with you and you know the need on the outlaying islands as well is so great and um by having that service it really bridged the gap to getting the people of need medical need quickly to this island where we have more of the larger facilities to um to um address their issues so mahalo for getting all that started Thanks. and mahalo for continuing that in the different parts of mexico as well so greatly needed that service so thank you yeah now we yeah. have to get back we have to get back yes. i mean like you do hey listen i used you in many ways when it was time for christmas i would be <laughs> giving away chocolate covered fortune cookies <laughs> to the crews to the patients all of that You're also a great customer of ours andy we appreciated you and all your uh kind gestures that you used us for to mahalo your people that you loved and, and service throughout the year. So we appreciate yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And we have Thank a lot of bridges that we cross together. We have, we have so many and it's not the end. It's still more because we're building in Mexico. I go to Mexico as often as I can love the people. Um, I love the food and I love the culture. So I'm going back. In fact, one of my first trips, once we open up, we'll be going back to Mexico City and uh, probably a week in Cancun and then back to Mexico City as we build that country healthier. And that's yeah, one of our that's goals. great. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, ever since I met you, you always wanted to build, engineer and design. That's you're just, I don't know what you don't do, but you just do want to do all these things. And I know that one of your passions, and you used to talk about this all the time, it was to build a museum of Mexico art in, in San Francisco. So I know it's come a long way. You put a lot of hours in there, and I don't want to say sweat because I don't know how much you sweat in San Francisco being so cool, but just give us an update with this mega project of, your, of yours. The Mexican Museum Smithsonian mm -hmm. began 40 years ago with an idea. And the last five years where I've been chairman of the board, we actually started construction. And now we have completed the building, not the interior, but the outside. So we spent, we raised $35.5 million just to do that without any debt. And now we're dealing with the interior. It's going to be a magnificent building. It's four stories. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to have, it has 17,000 pieces of art in the collection. And I'm very proud of it. I mean, it's something that I've grown to really become passionate about. <laughs> and uh, I may drive people crazy to get this done. No, but, but that's what it takes. You, it yeah. takes a driver like you to get things done like this. Well, you know, you never realize, you know, what it takes to build a building, especially <laughs> the opportunity to build a museum. Exactly. You know, not in lifetime, I think nobody really has that opportunity. When it came nobody. to me, I said, okay, I'm jumping in feet first. Right. And not only did you create this opportunity and saw the project from groundbreaking to where we are now, but to get it, I mean, it's an associate of the Smithsonian Institute. That's, that's amazing in itself. But then you also need to, in some way, work with someone working with the artist and the different museums to secure these pieces to come to your museum. Yeah. That itself is a big and we've had And we've had really good people give us collections. Mm -hmm. Like the Rockefeller family gave mm -hmm. us a very large collection of over 700 pieces of Mexican art. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had some very unique people. We recently got a collection, Wendy, of 81 pieces of pre-Columbian, pre-historic, wow. pre-Hispanic. Pre mm -hmm. um, the pieces are like going into the Arch Anthropological Museum in Mexico City. They're magnificent pieces. Wow. When I took the director of Bellas Artes, the finest Mexican museum, uh, to see it with me, his mouth fell open. He says, oh my God, this was a professor from UC Berkeley that spent 50 years of his life every year collecting. And he just was obsessed with collecting. And he collected in Europe, he collected in Latin America before it became illegal to take pieces out of countries. Mm. And it's an incredible collection we've been, we were given. So that's another example of, of, of art that we've gotten. Wow. So it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's one of these very good luck situations. Well, yeah. yeah, not just good luck. And yes, luck follows you, but the tenacity of your work ethics, your relationships that you build, so people trust you, you know, and entrust their collections to you and where you can put them so more and more people can appreciate it. So those are just mm -hmm. qualities that make a leader so great and, and, and get jobs like this, these mega jobs accomplished. So we will... 
look forward to walking into the museum and just knowing um, from the very beginning, I saw a lot of your hard work going into it through your post and all your, your emails to all of us. And I'm just so proud to be a part of that journey. Although you did all the work and all the, you know, anxiety driven evenings. Um, thank you for allowing us to be a part of that. That was Wendy, you're my Ohana, no question. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And, you know, so now we'll get to, um, you are an honorary consul general in Hawaii. How long have you served in that capacity? And who um, I presently have served 14 years wow. in that position. I was appointed by one president, yes, and then a second president, and now the third president. Wow. So I guess they want me to continue a non-paying <laughs> job. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, luckily we have that heart, you have that big heart, and you know, um, you're looking at the longevity and the connections that it can build versus financial reward and gain. Of course, financial reward is good too, but there are things that we just must do that has to be done without that, but just with the biggest heart that you have to continue that, Andy. So thank you for, for reaching out and continuing mm -hmm. to do what you do. And I know you have such a big heart for, you know, not just the people of Mexico, the Mexican people uh, of Hawaii, the Mexican national nationals or family members in Hawaii. So about how many do you uh, calculate um, how many Mexican national fam or families are here? We've, we've calculated between 27,000 and 30,000 Mexicans or Mexican national descendants. Wow. That's a mostly, big on three, mostly on three islands, Wendy. That's They're a big population. And um, yeah. I'm, I'm praying that we have enough facilities and um, you know, services that can support them because they need to be represented well as, as well. And so I know that's something that's in your heart and you're working you know, towards so that they too can have every opportunity like everyone else here in Hawaii as we welcome them. I know they, they work very hard. They're in the agricultural fields. Yes. Uh, they yes. work in the service industry, in the hotels and restaurants and in construction. Those are the three primary fields that the Mexican, Mexican, America, Mexican uh, nationals work in in Hawaii. Wow. Yeah. And I, I know. And now that I'm more in tuned, I'm listening more and more. And I, as, as soon as I hear a slight, a little accent, I'm asking, hey, where are you from? And they're like, mm, I'm from Mexico. I'm like, Mexico, what part? And I'm like, just like Ohana already. So I'm wanting them to feel that love here with us just immediately. And you know, just be so proud to be a Mexican nationalist here in our, in our beautiful islands. And I know that when I go to Mexico, I feel the same love and the aloha. So I want to make sure that they have that welcome here as well. So, That's very kind of you. That's yeah. It's, so, you know, we know Mexico, like Hawaii, is battling the coronavirus. How is the pandemic situation there? It's very bad. One of the reasons is that the government doesn't really feel the need to test. Oh. So we have no records, really, of how many are really sick. We know there's a lot of people dying. Uh, the problem is, is that you also have to have treatment. So they're waiting for, for vaccines. The problem is that Mexicans, are, by habit, it's a culture of like real Ohana, hugging, kissing, getting right. together. So they don't understand social distancing and masks. They don't understand it. So right. it's, it's really an education problem. It's much worse than we know. Um, right. And all we can do is battle it every day, hoping that people will understand that it's serious. I mean, I, I have people I know personally that have been affected by it. Some have, have passed away and some of them are really seriously ill. But it's a very difficult problem, you know, like it is in the States. Right, right. And, you know, like you mentioned, too, um, we may be here of the numbers, but those are really, I'm sure those are not even a great percentage of those uh, that have or experiencing corona are not even being able to get to the facility and to report it or to get the help because a lot of them are in rural areas that can't and won't go to get the service. You're, you're absolutely correct. Right. The World Health Organization has stated that Mexico probably has 10 times greater the numbers than they're reporting, right. partly for that. You know, right. The country has a very large population, you know, and, you know, over a very large area, a lot of the population lives in rural areas. Right. And there is no clinics to take care of them. Mm -hmm. And like a lot of families here in Hawaii where we have clusters in homes, 
you know, multiple generations in homes. I know that in Mexico, they have the same uh, lifestyle as we do here in the islands, where they do, you know, cluster in a home and multiple of generations. So that doesn't right. help either. But that also affects the Mexicans living in Hawaii. They're affected by the same, you know, multiple generation housing. Right, also. right, right. Yeah. Wow. So it's so, serious. It, it's very serious and it's it's sad and I, I, I knew that that's what you were going to tell me um, and I know the numbers are much greater than we hear in the news or anywhere printed but um, we just have to continue to pray for you know the cure and the wellness of the people of all people of the world yeah, so it's true while we're speaking on health let's let us speak a little bit about health related problems in Mexico and in the community of uh, Hawaii as well so can you share a little bit about health related problems? Sure. Mexico has the highest rate of adolescent diabetes in the world. Mm. They also have a very high rate of adult diabetes, type 2. Uh, as in Hawaii, the Mexican population also has a high rate of type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. That comes as a result of modern diets yes. as compared to what they used to eat. You know, beans, rice, tortillas and stuff. Now it's hamburgers, it's, you know, McDonald's. It's a lot is Coca-Cola. Mexico's rate of consumption of Coca-Cola is the highest per capita in the world. And in fact, one of the past presidents of Mexico, Vicente Fox, was the president of Coca-Cola of Mexico. So Coke, you can't get clean water in a village where you go or a right. small town, but you can always buy Coke. Right. You know, and that's one of the problems is the consumption is enormous. As a direct result of that, you also have dental health issues because they're not watching for their teeth and cavities are, are rampant. So those, that's the principally highest disease right now in Mexico. The second highest disease in Mexico uh, is COPD, breathing in, in the lungs, because they have a tremendously high incidence of smokers. Now, Hawaii doesn't have as bad with the Mexican community, but it's mm -hmm. still in the older population. It's still tough, you know. Wow. And then, then the, the third are like two competing diseases. One is orthopedic problems and also cardiac hypertension. So it's, it's one of these things that it's very typical, the diseases, Wendy, of what exists in the modern world. Mm -hmm. But diabetes is and it's hard, it's close to your heart. You know, it's a really tough disease. It's rampant. Right. And for Mexican kids to have the highest rate of adolescent diabetes in the world, we're not talking about a country, in the world, right. Right. is very serious. That's not good. That breaks my heart, Andy. Um, as you know, I sit on the board of directors for American Diabetes here in Hawaii for the last 10 years. And in the beginning, when I took the position of the board, we registered about 154,000 diabetics here, and our population is about 1.4 million people. And now 10 years later, we register about over 600,000 diabetics here in our islands and about 1.4 million people. So we're almost 50% of our population is diabetic. And yeah. so th that breaks my heart. And, you know, we, 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 we fight tirelessly and we put out, you know, events and, and trainings and talks to encourage people to make better lifestyle decisions, you know, with the processed food and then with the sugary drinks. And I always just said as simple as us stop drinking sugary drinks, you know, Coca-Cola by name, but all sugary drinks. You know, I, I in my heart truly believe that diabetes will drop about 50%. And then we work on the other issues. But in your country, in Mexico, uh, I understand. I mean, no different than when we go to other countries where water is an issue. So water is more expensive or not readily available. But yeah, you can get a bottle of Coke or any other pop and it'd be more palatable and pleasurable at that moment. You know, in the deep, in the, in the moment of that heat, you just want to quench your thirst. And that bottle of water is not readily available. So yes, we always want to reach for that bottle. Of I mean, they even, they even talked, Wendy, of raising taxes. On, on, on sugary drinks. Nobody cared. They'd be willing to pay the taxes because they, they basically, it's part of their, their natural consumption of diet now. Right, right. Have, have sugary drinks. Right. You know? and, and we, we've done studies and we saw the amount of pop and the processed food 
that a lot of these countries are consuming in the United States as well and Hawaii as well. Um, and that's really sad. And my goal, my goal right now as I retired from my chocolate factory is to help people to take their health back. And like what we're doing right now, Andy, making them aware of just making a simple lifestyle change. You yeah. know, when we're in Mexico or when I'm in China or in Hong Kong, uh, where water is not the best, we boil the water, you know, you boil and you boil. I mean, that's one mental way of saying the water is better to drink, but we filter and we boil and we boil and we bottle it. And then we drink that when we cook or at, when we're at home. So we're trying um, to do those little lifestyle changes to accommodate the issues of the community. And so- But again, Wendy, it's an education problem because yeah. with, the, with sugary drinks, it's the instant gratification. You grab it, you drink it, you know, it's done. And then it also gives you, with all that sugar and a little bit of caffeine in there, it gives you up and you're like, whoa. So, yeah, these are legal sources of um, uh, illegal substances that we can consume. And so people are excited about that. They're, they, they know that it's also uh, it's equivalent to Coke. You know, some of these yeah. sugary drinks, uh, sugar is equivalent to Coke, cocaine. And so... People are thinking, wow, I get it. I can buy it. It's free and I get the buzz off of it. So why not? And people just don't think most of the time, Andy. And so that's the sad part about all of this is just people are not thinking. But if they open up their hearts and their minds and if they're thinking about the generations to come, that's what our goal is. And I'm sure that's what you you share. And you when you you're, when you're out there, you're preaching the same thing. You know, we're taking all you sick bodies from one location to a hospital. How about we? develop some source of educational programs to educate the rural areas to help them. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely correct, Wendy. Healthier, and we wouldn't be as sick, but it just takes more plans like this. And um, I'm, I'm willing to do it. And I've done it in many small ways. No, you've, done, you've done great. Your leadership has been terrific. Yeah. So in terms of what you've done. And that's what we need you know, to whether do. It's, whether it's your roof gardens, whether it's, you know, diabetes education, all yeah. that, your, your leadership is so important. Yeah, I'm just following what you do, Andy, and you're doing it on a large scale, and I'm just there to just help on the lower levels to continue what message that you bring you, you out. You do it great. No, you do it great. This is a I mutual got, admiration society. I got a good mentor, so I'm excited about that. So mm -hmm. I know, Andy, I don't know if you want to discuss this, but I know at one time you also, you had a, a bout with Equali. Do you remember? Yes. yes. And so I got, it from a, I got it from a salad. I know. In California, and um, yep. when you did get it, and then you were, it really affected you. And oh, you, I was in the hospital. Yeah, you were fighting for your life, as Boy, I remember. You got good memory. Yeah, yeah, you got yes. good memory. And you yeah. recovered, and everything is back to normal. Yep. Well, kind. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm still breathing. <laughs> oh yeah. The problem is you're working harder now because yeah. <laughs> you want to yeah. just keep busy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, Andy, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. It really is great talking to you, honestly, Wendy. Yeah, yeah, I enjoy it so much. I just get so much. And even just watching your posts and watching your drive in every project that you you do, you do start and then you finish, it's amazing. And I want to also end with, I remember from the very beginning, you used to do Doctors Without Borders and you would spend your right. things. That holiday when you would take off from work, your office job and business, yeah. and you would go to different countries. Yeah, to mostly serve. Central America, yeah. Yes. I did it with three other guys who were surgeons, two from Paris and then one from the States and or wow. South Africa, depending which one. And we, I, my job was to be the mule. I drove the <laughs> trucks, you know, right. all the stuff. But we did a lot of surgeries on kids and stuff. It was, it was giving back. It's important. That's yeah. amazing. You got good memory, Wendy. You know? I, I remember well, everything about you, Andy, because yeah. it's so amazing. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. You know, right now, we have we have to say aloha to Andy. Aloha. Continue okay. to do the great work that you've been doing, and I know the, the best is yet to come because you're never yeah. going to stop. Yeah, but you so, keep it up, too. Thank Mahalo you, right? for everything, really. And uh -huh. aloha to everybody for watching the show. All right, and we'll come visit you at your Mexican museum soon. Aloha, Thanks. Andy. Aloha. aloha. Bye.